the comic technique, I think, will always be here. It has been here since caveman times, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to continue. Lounge and sun. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and I have another awesome interview for all of you guys today. Today, I'm talking to Tom DeFalco, one of the bigger names from Marvel Comics. He not only did he write some of our favorite stories, but he was also editor in chief and created, co-created one of my favorite characters, Spider Girl. How's it going, Tom? It, it's going great, Ryan. Thank, thanks for inviting me. Oh yeah, my pleasure, man. So first off, I, I like to, you know, I like to ask uh, pretty much everybody that's on the show how they first got into comics, what some of their first comic books were. I was wondering if you could share that with me. Well, um, I don't know exactly what the first comic book was that I had seen, but I know um, one of my cousins, uh, my cousin John, uh, handed me a Batman comic or a detective comic, and it was the first comic book I had ever seen. And, I, and all I remember is I looked at this, this character called Batman, and it scared the heck out of me. <laughs> But I, I, I had been a fan of comic strips, newspaper comic strips. And I liked the idea of this, this thing called a comic book. And uh, I started to hunt them, hunt them down. I, I, think, I think I was probably seven or eight years old. I, I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I discovered that, hey, my local candy store had them. And they only cost, uh, at the time, I think it was 10 cents. And I thought, wow, these, these are terrific things. And... And, you know, I've been lost ever since. You know. And wh why did you uh, decide to get into comics? What were your, some of your inspirations oh, writing-wise? Well, my inspirations writing-wise, <laughs> it, it's... Uh, I, I, I think Walt Kelly, who did Pogo, the, okay. the Pogo comic strip. Um, you know, obviously, Stan Lee, uh, and Bob Kaninger, and... Um, uh, Ed Grace Burroughs was, was my main uh, inspiration for writing. And, uh, and uh, Ed McBain, Evan Hunter, um, who used to write this thing called the 87th Precinct. Um, th these, these were my basic in inspirations. And um, you started at Archie, correct? You're, that's yep. how you started your career? Yep, that, that, that's where I started my comic book career. I... Uh, had been been in college and worked for newspapers and had sold a few short stories and did did some PR work that you know all sorts of things. I and I always tell people, hey, if you want to be a writer, be a writer first and a guy who does comics second. Just let comics be one one of the arrows in your quiver. Um, so I tried a bunch of different things. My goal at that time was to do a comic strip. And I thought, all right, you know, wh where can I learn how to do, you know, comics? Uh -huh. I sent out resumes to all the different companies, and I heard back from Archie. And they offered me a job in their uh, editorial production department. And, uh, you know, and then I was off to the races from there on in. <laughs> and uh, you, started, you started the Digest series, correct? <laughs> yes, for Archie. And what was where did that idea come from? Because I mean, they're still in supermarkets today. Well, uh, there was a, a Gold Key. I, I think they were called Gold Key Western at the time. I, uh, 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 they were producing digests featuring Mickey Mouse and and Turex and a stone and a bunch of these digest things. And I I saw a bunch of these digests and I thought, hey, this is this is a perfect format for Archie comics. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so I went to my, my boss, Victor Gorlick, um, who was at Archie for 50 plus years, uh, you know, a, a great editor. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't say enough superlative things about Victor. And he looked at it, he says, ah, it looks like a lot of work. I, I don't know if we want to do it. <laughs> he says, um, John Goldwater was one of the owners of the company. And... Um, he, he came in, and not, not the John Goldwater who's there now, you know, his father, uh, came in and, and, and he says, well, why don't you tell Mr. Goldwater your idea? So I held it up and I said, hey, I think the, these books would be great for us to, to do these. He looked at it, he says, ah, 
Are you out of your mind? Who cares about this nonsense? And he, he walked out. And about a week or two later, he comes back in with the books I had handed him and says, you know, I've been thinking, I think we should, <laughs> we should do these. Um, and, um, and I remember Victor looked at me and said, all right, it was your idea, hot shot. It's your problem now. <laughs> Deal with it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I dealt with the Archie comic digest uh, up until I left Archie. Was you know kind of my ba my main job there for the longest time. Yeah, and were they successful like right off the bat? Um, I I I assume they were successful enough because we kept increasing the number of digests we were doing and that sort of thing. In those days, I had no access to the actual sales, so I had oh. no. Yeah, I I know that our sales. Um, the guy in charge of uh, Archie Sales, a gentleman by the name of Ben Cooperstock, mm -hmm. um, came up with a really brilliant idea of uh, renting this space by super, supermarket ca uh, cash registers. Uh, and he, you know, he uh, made some deals with a couple of supermarket chains and the digest fit right into the TV guide racks and everything else like that. And uh, I think that that's what made the digests. I think that they're still on, on a lot of supermarket racks. Yeah, they. I mean, they still are. There's no more TV guides over there, so it's just it's just it's the Archie Digest. Digest. <laughs> you know, and and they were good value um, for the money. I, I, you know, Archie Archie still sends me the digest, but I haven't checked the price on them lately. But at the time when we started out. Um, you know, I, I remember thinking, well, this is actually a pretty good deal because yeah. you got a lot of a lot of pages. It, it was for a nice price. I, I still have the first a copy of the first Archie Digest. Oh, man, that's so cool. The one, which I, I never thought would be a collectible. And I don't even know if it is a collectible, but but, uh, you know, I have some of the early digests and, uh, you know, it, 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 a, a nostalgic kick for me. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, and after after you left Archie, can you talk about how, how did you end up at Marvel? Was that always like was that always one of your goals was to to write for Marvel? Um, yeah, not really. I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I I loved the Marvel comic books. I was a big Marvel fan, um, but. Um, I, you know, I didn't think I was good enough for Marvel. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm mainly a humor writer. I'm going to stick with humor. And um, I started doing things for Charlton and then eventually for DC. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Orlando, who was an editor at DC Comics, got hold of me one time. And, he, and uh, superhero stuff we used to refer to as straight stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, um, have you ever thought about doing straight stuff? And I remember saying, I don't know, Joe, it looks so hard. You know, it really looks complicated, it really looks hard. And he said, are you kidding me? He says, you got to do characters. He says, you know how to do characters, kid. You got to do plots. You know how to do plots, kid. He said, and, and here's the kicker. It doesn't have to be funny. They're paying you for, you know, they're paying you the same rate and you're only doing half the work. <laughs> So it doesn't have to be funny, and I, and I kept thinking, oh, that's right. You you you're doing the same work. You you you're, you're getting paid the same amount per page, and you're only doing half the work. I thought, oh, all right, I'll, I'll try doing straight stuff, and um, he um, he put me in touch with Denny O'Neill, who called me up and asked me to do a romance comic book. Um, which I thought, yeah, and this was not my idea of doing straight stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll try doing a romance comic. And then Denny liked the story enough that he asked me to do some uh, Jimmy Olsen stuff. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, and then from there, I just kept doing things. You know, before we get into Spider-Man, because I, th I think a lot of your Spidey stories are, are some of the more popular ones. You had a hand in the G.I. Joe and Transformers franchises. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on on that. I know you you wrote some of the backstories for the G.I. Joe characters as well. 
no, no, no. That was all Larry Hama. Oh, okay. <laughs> that. Um, I, I'll give you the basics of the of the GI Joe stuff. Um, at one point, uh, Jim Shooter came to me and said, uh, "You know, I'm gathering a team. We're gonna we're gonna do something for Hasbro for co- called GI Joe." And I said, "What do you mean the old dolls? Because they, they they used to be Barbie, you know, Barbie sized dolls." Right. And he says, "Yeah, they they're gonna bring back GI Joe." Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, war comic will do really well these days. Um, and uh, I remember that it was um, uh, Jim Shooter, uh, uh, Archie Goodwin, uh, Larry Hama, a gentleman by the name of Nell Yamtov, who, who dealt with a lot of licensing and eventually became a, an editor, uh, edited me on Fantastic Four, and uh, Mike Hopson, the publisher. And we went to G.I. Joe and they showed us, you know, G.I. Joe and they said, hey, yeah, we've got the G.I. Joe and he and he's G.I. Joe the Ranger, G.I. Joe the, uh, I, I forget the different different groups, but it was one guy who was basically seven military things. Mm-hmm. And uh, we all looked at each other and said, well, actually, actually, you should probably have seven different guys, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And um, and uh, it was said, well, who do they fight? Well, they, they didn't have a, a villain or, or anything. So uh, Archie Goodwin, I think, came up with Cobra Command. I don't remember who exactly came up with the idea that G.I. Joe was, was the code name for the team. Since it's such a good idea, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it was Larry Hama. Uh-huh. Because Larry Hama came up with most of the good ideas with G.I. Joe. We presented that to Hasbro. They, I'm, I'm going to say, we, we convinced them to do it. They, I, I think, originally their their the, the first notion was, hey, it's, you know, they're all GI Joe, mm-hmm. uh, and they kept saying to us, well, who's Joe? We say Joe is the name of the team. It's the name of the team, and eventually they got that. Uh, they, they decided they liked the idea of Cobra. And then we were off and running. Larry Hammer did all of the um, the backstories, those little cards that appeared on all the comic books. He basically used the the Marvel Universe entries as a as a template, and and he wrote that. Um, GI Joe, I, you know, I I I think of GI Joe as maybe ninety percent Larry Hammer, maybe ten percent of uh, uh, Archie Goodwin, because Archie did come up with uh, Cobra. Now, maybe Archie should get more credit, and uh, you know, I, I just got to sit on sit on the sidelines and look at all the great work they were doing. Was, you know, I'm you know, I was a lucky guy. Got to, got to work with with geniuses, and, <laughs> and and still 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 credit from the to this very day. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the Transformers? Well, Transformers. You know, Hasbro was so happy with G.I. Joe that they later came to us and they said, they said, uh, hey, you know, we, we have a top secret thing we want you to uh, uh, work on. I, I don't know if this story is known or unknown, but Hasbro showed up and they showed up with their lawyer and they had uh, non-disclosure agreements for us to mm-hmm. sign. So naturally, you know, we had to call down our lawyer. And uh, the two lawyers discussed it for like three or four hours <laughs> to, to get the <laughs> the verbiage correctly, and you know, and, and the rest of us were just killing time for these three or four hours. Uh, and we were very friendly with the Hasbro guys then, and, and we all decided we didn't like lawyers. <laughs> I know that's a that's a prejudicial thing. I'm I'm, I'm still not over it. <laughs> uh, but but uh, they finally got the. The agreement signed. We all signed the agreement, um, and they said, "Yes, we, you know, we're, we're going to do something new." And they put one of the Japanese transformers on the table. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember when they put it on the table, I looked up at Larry Hama, and, and we just looked at each other across the table, and we excused ourselves and said, "We have to leave for a moment." I said, "Wait a minute, we're waiting four hours for this meeting to give, <laughs> guys." We really have to wait a minute, you know, and he ran to his office. I ran to my office and we came back and we had 
more Japanese Transformers and we laid them out in front of it ourselves. <laughs> and the guy from house, where did you get those? We bought them at, at Forbidden Planet, the comic book store down the block. <laughs> <laughs> And our lawyer said, wait a minute, if these things are for sale every already, <laughs> you know, those <laughs> non-disclosure forms. And, 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 and the Hasbro lawyer said, well, wait a minute, we, we have to adjust these non-disclosure forms. And the Hasbro guy, a gentleman by the name of Bob Poopers, who was in charge, said, give me all the forms. And our lawyer said, no, 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 you can't take all the forms. Said, Just give me all the forms. So we handed them to Poopers. He took all the forms and he ripped them up. He says, enough these <laughs> these forms. Let's start talking. And um, initially, you know, once I realized it was a robot thing, I was working on something called Star, Star Ears, which was also a robot thing. So I said, I have to excuse myself because I, I, you know, I'm working for another toy company on, on another project. So I left, the, I left that meeting. I worked on Star Ears. We finished the Bible. We got the comic book out. And then I found out they were still working on Transformers. And, um, and they called me in and they showed me the development work. And I, I remember thinking, wait a minute, this thing happened, you know, uh, you know, in the prehistory of the United States, can't we change the timeline or something, have it happen more and, you know, uh, but, but they were sold on that idea. And, and then I just futzed, you know, just did a little futzing around. Uh, Transformers, Again, I'm, I'm going to say a, a lot of, most of that was Bob Budiansky. So he should be, be getting the credit. You know, I'd, I'd love to steal credit from Hama, steal credit from Budiansky. <laughs> you know, I know these guys and, and they'll beat me up. So I can't, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk Spider-Man. During your time on Spider-Man, you created Silver Sable. And you also wrote the Black Costume. Comic, right. the first appearance, right? And you, I think you edited it on Secret Wars, which is where the 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 symbiote first appeared. What was the story behind behind that? I I've always been kind of curious, like how did the black costume even come to be? Was that your idea? Was it? No, no. Earlier on, a gentleman by the name of I think it was Randy Schuler had come up with a plot where Spider Man gets a, a new costume. Um, that, that plot was recently uh, put together by uh, Peter David and Rick Leonardi in a comic book that came out, I'm, I'm going to say, a, a year or so ago. So you could see Randy Shuler's actual plot and my, and my notes on it. And Shooter liked the idea of Spider-Man getting a new costume that gave him different powers. And he, he, he decided to buy the plot, but the plot needed a lot of work. Uh -huh. So he assigned me to work with with Randy, and we, we we worked, and he did a couple of versions of it, and just could could never quite get it into into an actual story. So eventually, he decided he had enough, and and I had enough, and we, we just shelved shelved it because uh, the you know his original idea was Reed Richards, who has so much spare time, had decided to um, sit down and create a new costume for Spider-Man that had all sorts of special powers. Mm -hmm. And that really didn't make a lot of sense in, in, in the grand scheme of things. All right, so we go on. And then eventually we, we sold the toy license to, to Mattel, uh, which eventually came out as Marvel, uh, Marvel Secret Wars. And we were trying to come up with things that were exciting about Secret Wars. Because uh, we had this idea that the, the heroes vanish one month and then they come back and there are changes. Mm -hmm. and, and Shooter said, yeah, let's do that Randy Shuler idea. You know, I don't think he, he remembered Shuler's name, but, it, you know, <laughs> let's, let's give Spider-Man a new costume. And we re read the description that Randy had had. And it really was not anything like the black costume that we had. Mm -hmm. But but it was supposed to be a stealth costume with more black in it. So Shooter hired a bunch of artists and said, we want to give Spider-Man a new costume. You know, all we know is that it, it's, a, it, it's a dark stealth costume. Go to town. And a bunch of guys did, did sketches. And uh, Mike Zek um, did the sketches that Shooter liked the best. 
So he, he, uh, we decided that's what the costume was going to be, uh, more or less. And uh, then Roger Stern was writing Amazing Spider-Man at the time. So he did the plot for, for issue 252. Uh-huh. And then um, the Avengers opened up. So Roger decided to leave Spider-Man and work on the Avengers. And the editor of Spider-Man, because I had edited before him, said, hey, you know the character. And I said, yeah, but I don't, I, I, don't, I can't write Spider-Man's style dialogue. He uh-huh. said, well, why don't, why don't you try it? I, I don't think I can do it. But he, he said, try it. So I thought, all right, listen, I'll, uh, uh, there were two, two plots, uh, two issues with stern plots. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll try it. We'll, we'll find out right away whether or not I can do it. And if I can't do it, We'll get somebody else. So that's why I did 251 and 252. 252, the, the costume had all sorts of special powers. And I I went to Jim Shooter and I said, listen, the costume can can do this, it can do that, it can do that. And he said, yeah. And I said, how does this work? And he said, well, you're the writer. Come up with something. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not the writer. I'm, I'm the filling guy, you know. <laughs> Uh, he said, but hey, it's your problem. Deal with it. it was uh, had these cards about nature and stuff like that and was doing reading, trying to figure out, you know, how does it work? And I found out about sharks and symbiotes and uh, uh, actually whales and symbiotes and that sort of thing. So I said, it's a symbiote. It's, yeah. an alien, it's actually an alien creature. It's an alien symbiote that has its own intelligence about and I explained it, and Trudy said, yeah, okay, whatever. Get the heck out. <laughs> he said, that sounds complicated. Just go out and do it. And um, uh, Ron Friends was also tagged to write to, to pencil 251 and 252 because John Ramita Jr. was working on the X-Men, and he needed a temporary break from uh, Spider-Man so he could get the X-Men on time. Uh-huh. So, uh, you know... I always look back on because people look look at that as the beginning of our run, except we were two filling guys. <laughs> and when people heard that Spider Man was going to get a new costume, they were so outraged that at one point the guy from the mailman brought in this bag of mail, dumped it on my desk. You know, big mail, you know, big big sack of mail, dumped it on my desk, and glared at me and said. I don't know what you did, but don't ever do it again. <laughs> he walked out. And then Shooter came to me and said, listen, we're getting so much negative press and so much negative stuff about this new costume. When, when does Spider-Man get his new costume? I said, 252. He said, get rid of it in 253. I said, Jim, we can't do that because he doesn't get it until the eighth issue of Secret Wars. We got to at least hold it until then. And Shooter said to me... <laughs> Listen, if sales of Spider-Man go down because of this, it's going to be your butt. And, <laughs> and you might get kicked off the book because of this. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Because I thought, I'm going to get kicked off the book anyway. I don't care. Yeah. You know, my plan was, oh, uh, keep it for eight, keep it for eight issues and then, and then get rid of it. And then to every, <laughs> everyone's surprise, you know, Secret Wars, originally Shooter had tried to get a, a bunch of people to write Secret Wars. He couldn't get anybody interested because nobody wanted to do Secret Wars as a toy book. It's connected to toys. Nobody cares about a toy book. This is like Rom Space Night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so uh, he, I know he had asked Chris Claremont. He had asked a bunch of guys. They didn't want to be bothered. So Shooter ended up writing it himself. 252. You know, I'm... I'm I've already told you I'm the filling guy. Marvel team up. The regular writer on Marvel team up didn't want to do it because you didn't want to be associated with the black costume. So I ended up having to do the plot for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, this thing we we thought it was going to be, you know, everybody's telling us it's going to be big disaster, big disaster. You know, nowadays because it was such a success, people think this was a design play. <laughs> We were all going into it thinking, oh, we're going to, ah, the fans are going to hate us. <laughs> it, uh, other writers were saying, you shouldn't be working on this book because you'll, you know, 
this is going to destroy your career. You're, you're never going to get another assignment after this. Um, but you, know, you, you never know what the fans are going to like un until it actually comes out in print. Fans yeah. hate everything until it comes out in print. Yeah, that's true. After after that ended up being successful, what else, during your tenure on Spider-Man, what else were some of your favorite moments that you got to do? I'd like to say I had a blast on Spider-Man. I really enjoyed working with Ron Friends. Mm -hmm. And and he and I started to, you know, to talk about things. And I kept encouraging him, hey, if you get any ideas, just, just tell me. <laughs> And um, as time went on, he started getting more and more ideas until he was, you know, he was practically plotting the book. <laughs> and uh, I thought, hey, I get to sit back <laughs> and, and write on his coattails. This is great. Um, but, you know, I, I, I had a great time with working with Ron Friends. Um, I'd like to say we had a great time working on Spider-Man. Most of the time when the book would come out, Ron and I would go over the book and we would be crossing out panels and crossing out balloons and saying, we didn't need this panel. We didn't need this balloon. And we kept doing these autopsies on the books because we thought Spider-Man is supposed to, you know, should be the best book Marvel's doing. So we got to keep on working. We got to keep honing our craft until we, we get it right. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we ever thought we got it right. I think we're still trying to get it right. Um, uh, and, and we just kept sweating it out, waiting every issue to get fired. <laughs> Post Spider-Man, you became editor-in-chief, right? Or was that during your tenure? No, no, no. I, uh, um, it was after Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. And you were also writing Thor and Fantastic Four during that time, correct? Um, no, that, that, that again was later on. Okay. I think, uh, I started writing Thor before I became editor in chief. Mm -hmm. After Spider-Man, I, I, I didn't do much writing for Marvel for a while. Uh, in, in, in point of fact, they sent me to England for a couple of months to be working with the English group. Mm -hmm. And I, and while I was in England, every once in a while, they'd ask me to do some fill-ins which I thought, <laughs> and I would say to the guys, can't you get anybody in the States to do them? <laughs> when, I, when I came back, uh, Ron and I heard that uh, Daredevil was coming open. Mm. So, so we went to Ralph Macchio. We, 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 dis we started to discuss Daredevil. We thought, hey, hey, yeah, we could have a lot of fun doing Daredevil. And I uh, went to Ralph Macchio as the editor and said, hey, Ralph, Ron and I really want to pitch for Daredevil. And he says, uh, uh, he says, I can't really worry about that now because Thor was very late. I, I need some fill-ins. I'm desperate for, for a fill-in. He says, you think you can do a fill-in for Thor? I said, yeah, you know, we could probably do a fill-in for anything. Yeah. Uh, so Ron and I got together and we did a, a fill-in for Thor. I think it was the, uh, I don't remember if it was the Secret Wars fill-in or the Once in Future Thor fill-in, which, which, one of those. And then while we were working on that, Ralph said, hey, I could use a, a second film. Could you do a second film? I said, yeah, sure. So we did, did a second one. And then, you know, once we were done with the second film, I said to, to you know, Ralph said, yeah, I, and I, I want you guys to do a book. I said, Daredevil. He says, no, Thor. <laughs> Thor, we, we can't do Thor. We don't do Cosmic. And he said, you just did two issues. I said, yeah, but they were films. We could do a film for anything. <laughs> Uh, I said, but I don't, I don't know if we could do Thor. And he said, you, you, trust me, you can do Thor. I, I said to Ron, how do you feel about Thor? He says, well, one of my favorite characters. So we started to work on Thor. And, and, um, and then a couple of months later, um, the, the company decided to make a change. And it, it was kind of an expected change. Uh -huh. Um and it had always been my theory that when the company decided to get rid of Shooter, they would get rid of me too, because I was Shooter second in command. And I thought, yeah, you get rid of both of us. So I was already planning a post comic book career, because um, I could see the handwriting on the wall for Shooter, and I just assumed we were both going to get fired, and and had uh, was planning to be out of comics. 
I mean, uh -huh. to be out of comics a number of times. Uh -huh. um, and then it, at, at one point they decided to get rid of Shooter, and then they told me that I was going to be in charge. And I, th and I thought, wait, me? And I remember saying to the president of the com company, I said, I, I don't know if this is the wise choice for you. I said, because I'm really a freelancer masquerading as a staff person. <laughs> and, and, and if you put me in charge, I, I'm going to just spend my time making, you know, doing whatever I can to improve the lot of the freelancers. Companies looked at me and he said, well, that's what you should be doing. I said, we need to be making a profit, but you really should be watching out for your people. So that's what we want you to do. I said, we'll probably argue about things, but, you know, go ahead and do do that. And I thought... Yeah, I can't argue with that. So I figured oh, I'll take the job for a year or two and we'll see how things work out. <laughs> I, I was not expecting to be be there as long as I was. So you were editor in chief into 94, I, I believe, if my my research is correct. I mean, I was the kid. I was I was seven at that time. But I know that the 90s, you know, when Image formed, um, all the artists left from from Marvel and the speculator market was was becoming really big. Were you still editor in chief when the bubble, before the bubble popped, or was, or did the bubble pop and you kind of like were at the tail end of it? Um, I think the bubble was starting to pop right before they got rid of me. The speculator market, it was an interesting market because um, when when the image guys went. Uh, left, um, suddenly there was a lot of publicity about comics. Two, two big things had happened around that time. Marvel went public and did very well in the, in the stock market. <clears throat> and then the image guys left and brought all this publicity to comic books. And suddenly, like 30 new companies came up. And they all wanted to be Marvel overnight. Like, you know, all of these companies came out and they were, they, they'd start with 20 some odd titles, mm -hmm. forgetting that Marvel basically had, uh, you know, started with um, eight bi-monthly titles right. and, uh, and and had that for, for about, I don't know, six or seven years before they started to expand. But mm -hmm. these companies all came out with first issues, you know, everything was enhanced covers, blah, blah, blah. And, and the speculated market was booming. And, you know, people were investing in these things like crazy. Uh, I remember at one point I walked in and somebody was a comp uh, comic book store. A guy was complaining to me, says, uh, you know, I had a bunch of Marvel comics they didn't sell. I said, how much do you have? And he took me in his storeroom and he had like, um, you know, the, the boxes that comic books come in. I, I don't know how many is in a box, but he had like a box and a half of Marvel comics that hadn't sold. Yeah. And I said, oh, man, well, you know, as long as you sell, you know, half of what, what you've purchased, you've broken even. Uh, so uh -huh. if anything beyond that is, you know, and nobody wants to get stuck with comics. And then I looked and he had like 10, 10 cases of, of uh one of our competitors, number ones. Oh, and I looked, I said, wait a minute, what about all this stuff? And he said, oh, you don't understand. This this is money in the bank. And I said to him, you know, I think your bank is already foreclosed and you don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hey, he's complaining to me about, you know, a box and a half and he's got, you know, 10 cases of this thing. And, and, and that was the only the, the thing in front. And I could see other, you know, many more boxes behind right. I thought okay all of that is is dead inventory um and the summer before I was let go I, I think the year before they had the, the the death of Superman which got tremendous publicity sold a, a lot of copies and that sort of thing and the summer before I was let go they they had the return of Superman and every comic book store ordered return of Stu Superman like they wish they had ordered Death of Superman. Right. You know, they and they ordered two or three times the amount of, for, for Return of Superman. And the Return of Superman 
The death of Superman was a, a national event. It was covered in every magazine, on every TV show, everything else like that. The return of Superman was covered by two fanzines. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, I, I, much more than that, but yeah, um, and was financially a bust and put a lot of stores out of business. Mm-hmm. You know, started to pop the the speculative market. Um, you know, that, that year, Marvel the the the, the market uh, was down thirty five percent. Oh wow, Marvel personally was up 15 percent so we actually did pretty good Mm -hmm. Uh, not as good as previous years but you know if the rest of the market is down 35 and you're up 15 you you think you did good i know why the company decided to get rid of me there there were two things going on uh somebody came up with the brilliant idea marvel at that time was doing about 120 titles oh wow and uh, and they were all very pro- they were all profitable. Um, and the publisher gets the smallest percentage of the profit. Well, no, I think the distributor gets the smallest percentage. We got the second smallest. The retailer, got, you know, got the biggest percentage. Retailer made fifty percent on it. We made maybe thirty percent. You know, and the retailers made three to five uh, percent. The the distributors. Anyway, so if we're making money on a pro- on a title, everybody else down the line is making money on the title. But uh, a brilliant marketing person, and I say brilliant, meaning an idiot, um, came up with this idea. Hey, we're doing 120 titles. If if we cut it to 60 titles, would the remaining titles all sell twice as, twice as well and double our margins and increase our profits? And I laughed at him. And then I realized that, you know, I was in a meeting with him and the guy in charge of direct sales and the president of the company, and they all had these insulted faces on. And I thought, wait a minute, these idiots are, they're serious. They, they, <laughs> they, they think this is going to happen. And I said, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. You know, think of think of comic books as movies. Every week, movies come out. If if three good movies come out in, in a weekend, maybe you can see two of them, and you say, okay, I'll I'll see the next one next week. If mm-hmm. no good movies come out that weekend, you you don't go see a bad movie. All right. You, know, you, said, you go off a pizza instead. And I said, you know, you go to a comic book store. You know, if they have the titles that you want, you buy them. If they don't have the titles you want, you buy a candy bar or, or, or you go rent a movie. You know, you don't buy a, a title that you're not interested in. And they said, well, you got four Spider-Man titles. If you if you got rid of two, wouldn't the other two sell twice as much? I said, no, it's because it's the same guy is already buying all four of them yeah. because he loves, he loves Spider-Man. I said, you're thinking of his four titles. He's thinking of it as Spider-Man once a week. That every week I get to read a Spider-Man story, and you know, and uh, I couldn't convince them they were wrong. And then they, at one point, they said, "You know, we're thinking of buying our own distributor." And I said, "Are you guys crazy? That's the worst business to get in, in, involved in." So because I was against the, those two things, they thought, eh, "It's time for a change. We're going to get rid of the Falco," which, you know. Hey, listen, they should have got rid of me years ago. Uh, I, I always look at the being an editor-in-chief or being an editor is like being a football coach. When you have a winning season, you're great, you're a genius, you're terrific. You get a losing season, get rid of the bum. So it's time <laughs> to get rid of the bum. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they should have listened to you about the, the distribution for sure. I mean, that obviously led them down a path to where they ended up filing uh, bankruptcy, if I remember correctly. So, um, Well, the, the bankruptcy had more to do with their with, with the corporation and their stock things than, than oh, the okay. sales. But, but I like to say, hey, they fired me. They went bankrupt six months later. <laughs> now let's, let's jump into, you know, post your time as editor-in-chief, post the, the bubble popping, and one of my favorite creations of yours, Spider-Girl. I wanted to ask you how, like, okay, so she appeared in a What If, issue 105, 
and that kicked off the MC2, which was, you know, the all the legacy characters in the future of Marvel, kind of. Where did the idea for Spider-Girl come from, and was that always your plan to kind of branch off and do a separate line? Um, it was not a plan. I'm going to start that off. They decided to... Um... They offered me a writing contract, which surprised me because I, because uh, when they told me they were going to let me go, I just planned my post comic book career again. <laughs> um, they offered me a writing contract, contract, um, and uh, you know I ended up staying, and uh, I was working on the Spider Man titles, and, and we were doing the Clone Saga. And in the course of the Clone Saga, we discovered Mary Jane was pregnant and we decided that it was going to be a, a girl baby and blah, blah, blah. And um, the Clone Saga went on a lot longer than any of us had anticipated. And uh, the reason why it did was because it was selling, you know, after the distributors, comic book, you know, sale, after Marvel bought its own distributor, comic book sales plummeted. And... Um, the only two groups of titles that kind of recovered were the X-Men titles and the Spider-Man titles. So the Clone Saga was actually selling so well that they kept it going for a lot longer than we planned to go. I kept thinking, ah, you know, Spider-Man's going to have a daughter. This could be cool some, somewhere along the line. Um, and then... You know, time passed. Uh, eventually, I was taken off the Spider-Man titles, and it was assigned What If. And What If was going to be my regular title. So I thought, i got to come up with some ideas for, for What If. And one of the ideas I came up with is, hey, you know, what if the, uh, you know, Spider-Man's daughter grew up and be became Spider-Girl? Uh -huh. And I uh, I remember calling, calling Ron Friends, and saying, hey, listen, I'm, I'm doing what if and blah, blah, blah. And um, I'd like to, you know, would you like to work on this thing about uh, Spider-Girl? He said, Spider-Girl, that's it. You know, why, why call her Spider-Girl? Why don't you call her Spider-Woman? I said, because eh, Spider-Woman has this stink of death on that title. That There have been like four or five Spider-Women by that time. Let's do a Spider-Girl. We'll, 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 we'll be the only Spider-Girls. It's one of the few what if numbers I, I remember 105. And um, we're working on the issue, and you know, Ron and I, you know, we you know put together the plot and we set it up for the future. And Ron did, Ron, who is, is a, a total professional, figured, you know, if Mary Jane and Peter are there, we have to figure out what they look like in their older age. And 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 we had a scene where. We go to the, uh, you know, Fantastic Four, and I said, yeah, but, we, you know, we should do something with the Fantastic We'll make it the Fantastic Five. And he says, oh, I, I want to draw her, her be the robot. <laughs> and uh, so we drew the F Fantastic Five and going to have the Avengers. So we drew in a future Avengers team, and we're just goofing around, having a good time. But Ron's doing all these basic sketches on him. On it. And as we finish the issue... Ron said to me, you know, I really like this character. She's a fun character. You think we could ever do a sequel? And I said, at the time, I said, I don't know, Ron. This is a what if. You know, how many times have they done sequels to what ifs? I said, you know, maybe a year from now. Who knows? And he said, well, you know, if, if we ever get a chance for a sequel, let me know. And, and, and I'll do that. And I said, okay, but in the meantime, how about we do a Thor Thunderstrike? <laughs> what if? And, uh, and we started working on that one. Um, so we we did the, the, the what if, and I had a bunch of the sketches, and I dropped them off with the editor. I said, yeah, this is the kind of, this is the kind of work that Ron does beforehand. And, and you, you don't even want to see the Bibles I did for all these characters, because... Ron and I are crazy like that. Um, and we kept on working on, on the what ifs. And then somewhere along the line, Bob Harris, who was the editor-in-chief at the time, comes up to me in the hall and he says, hey, that, that what if you did sold really well. And I said, which one? He said, the Spider-Girl one. 
and I, I saw the the uh, the presentation you did for the new series. I said, I didn't do a presentation for a new series. I said, yeah, I saw the, all the sketches. I said, no, no, that that was for the for the, <laughs> for the actual issue. And he says, well, do you think you could do like six issues of of this Spider Girl? I said, yeah, sure, we could do six issues of anything. And I said, what are you going to do with it? He says, well, we're going to do this thing with Walmart. We're, we're going to put three comic books in a bag. And um, and I need you to come up with two other titles that fit in with Spider-Girl. Uh, I said, two other titles? I said, can you do it? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> he says, but one of the titles, he said, I, I really like that Kid Juggernaut. Um, so do one with Kid Juggernaut. And I thought, who the heck is Kid Juggernaut? And I, I went back and I saw, oh, there's Juggernaut in the in the back. Oh, that's supposed to be the real Juggernaut, but I, I guess he's Kid Juggernaut now. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ron and I started putting together the uh, MC2 thing. The original plan was to do six issues, and then they told us they wanted 12 issues of each of the titles. And, um, you know, we, we, that that was all we were planning to do. Uh, they were se selling in the direct market and selling pretty well in the direct market. Uh, so uh, Bob said, listen, we want you to do two other titles, but one of the titles you should keep. So which 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 of the three titles it was J2, Avengers Next and Spider-Girl? Which of those titles do you want to keep? And um, we looked at the sales and there was a, a, a Avengers Next and, and Spider-Girl were, were both selling pretty well. Uh -huh. So it was a flip of the coin. And I said, uh, you know, Ron, you want to keep Avengers Next? And he says, well, you're thinking of doing this character called The Buzz. He says, he says I, I, you know, if you're going to do The Buzz, I got to do The Buzz. And I said, well, if you're going to do the buzz, then then we'll keep Spider Girl, because you know, we'll keep Pat on Spider Girl, and we'll, you know, and we'll we'll go ahead, and, and then uh, we were told just just do uh, I forget it was five or six issues, <laughs> and then they said to me with Spider Girl, hey listen, instead of issue sixteen being the last issue, let let issue seventeen be the last issue, and let it be a double size issue. I said fine. And then as we got to issue 17, they said, you know what? We could use six more of Spider-Girl. And they kept asking for six more for the next 13 years. You probably couldn't even have fathomed, right, how, how beloved the character became. I mean, every time it got canceled, the fans, the outpouring of support, was it, it was unmatched. I've, I've never heard of another title being canceled and brought back like spider girl was what were what were those feelings when like as a, as a creator like to see this outpouring of fan support every it, time it, it was incredible um you know like here's a secret behind comics in the direct market sales for the most part only go down mm -hmm. so the the sales department would look at spider girl see where the sales were and project as of this issue it should be canceled so they, they would decide that it should be canceled then. And, you know, the fans would hear about it, this and that. And then as we would get to the issue where it was supposed to be canceled, suddenly they'd look at the sales and say, wait a minute, sales went up. Sales never go up in the direct market. Yes. <laughs> sales have gone up. All right, we're, we're not going to cancel it now. We're going to do the new projections and we're going to cancel it at this number. Uh -huh. And then we'd get to that number and sales had gone up. <laughs> Gone up again, um, and then at a certain point they started reprinting them in those little uh, manga style books, right? Uh, selling them through Scholastic, and those books were selling a hundred to one hundred and twenty thousand an issue. We were Marvel's best selling trade paperbacks, which annoyed a lot of <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> who were doing you know we're doing great art and this trash is selling up. Ten times more than we are. How could this happen? It was uh, Spider Girl was always a, a very unique experience. Um, 
and it was always always looked like it was on the verge of cancellation and it was always coming back i think uh, issue 60 at one point they said this time definitely it's definitely going to be canceled no hope for re reprieve it's it's definitely canceled nothing you can do about it and and around the time i was turning in the last issue i walked around the marvel offices and I said to editors, anybody have any work for me afterwards? And they all said, well, we'll look around, we'll look around. And I thought, okay, nobody has any work for me. So I basically went around and said goodbye to everybody, figuring I'm done. You know, time, time to focus on my post marvel career again. <laughs> uh, and I walked out, said goodbye to everybody, figured it was all done. And then on April 1st, I got a call from the editor who said, um, uh, sales department looked at the sales and uh, we're not canceling the book. We need a plot in two days. And I, I said, oh, yeah, and I'm going to fall for this April Fool's joke. And I hung up on him. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he and eventually called me back and, you know, and I never once believed him until uh, that night around 730 at night. I got a call from Tom Brevoort calls me up. He says, listen, it's 7.30 at night. I want to go home. You're the last person I want to be talking to at 7.30 at night. <laughs> Spider-Girl has not been canceled. <laughs> we need a plot in two days. Can you do a plot in two days? And I said, yes. And he said, what ideas do you have? And I said, none. <laughs> <laughs> but I will have a plot for you in two days. Uh, I says, can you give me any information whatsoever? I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to call the story Marked for Death. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to come up with a plot called Marked for Death. <laughs> and I will have a plot for you in two days. And then I called up Ron. I said to him, hey, Ron. <laughs> I'm, uh, no, no, no. I called up Pat. Pat was still on the book. I said, Pat, we got to come up with it. Uh, I think I think it was Pat. Yeah, uh, Pat. And, and Pat, Pat said to me, you sure? It's not a joke. It's not a joke. We, we got to come up with a I, I have to come up with a plot in, in, in two days. And and all I know is I'm going to call Mark for death. And he goes, all right, I'm on. I'm game. And um, and then we were up and running wow. again. Um, uh, I think uh, Ron Friends. Uh, replace Pat in the middle of that because Pat was offered a comic book that was guaranteed to go for two years. Um, and he hated leaving Spider-Girl. Oh, no, no. Actually, that happened before. That happened before Mark for Death. That happened before Mark. Yeah. I'm sorry. He, he was offered a comic book. He knew that Spider-Girl was going to be canceled with issue 60. He was offered a comic book that had a guarantee of two years. And he said, I, I really feel I should stay with Spider-Girl. I said, Pat, don't be an idiot. Take that other assignment. You know, there's only two or three issues left of Spider-Girl. Don't be an idiot. Take, take the assignment. You know, if, if it was me, I'd dump you in a second. You should dump me. Just go. <laughs> and, uh, so he took the, the comic book. The comic book lasted four issues. Um, and Spider-Girl went on for another, I don't know how many years. Uh, just the weird things in comic books, you know, and Ron ended up doing, you know, all the rest of the issues. Funny games. I personally think a book like Spider Girl is sorely missed in, in this market nowadays. Um, is, is there any chance in the future that you might return back to Mayday, Parker, or you or Ron friends come back together and do another short run? If Marvel ever asked Ron and I to come back and do Spider Girl, we would be back. Okay. Um, I just can't envision Marvel ever asking us to come back. Spider Girl was a book that was it was a heavy soap opera book. Um, it was a book filled with characterization and and uh, you know what I refer to as hoo ha action. And a lot of soap opera stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, people talk about world building. We bu built the whole world about around Spider-Girl. 
you know, every everybody in the cast had their own subplots. Mm-hmm. Um, and nobody does that kind of book anymore. These days, most comic books don't even have supporting casts. You know, most books don't even have a story. Most books, <laughs> uh, they're, they're part of a part of a story. Um, you know, we tried to make sure that every, you know, even if it was part of a of a five part story, that each each issue had a beginning, middle, and end, uh, because we never knew when we were going to get canceled. Yeah. Um, and we were just heavily involved in real characterization where we treated the characters as real people, which these days you don't see a lot of that. The characters are treated more like avatars of video games. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's what the market is today. I don't think that it would ever occur to Marvel to you know, pull Ryan and I out of retirement. I think that these days, if they ever decided to do, bring Mayday back, they'd probably get a woman writer, a woman artist, and a woman editor. Um, you know, and, and whatever they decide to do, that, you know, that's fine. I, 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 um, you know, I, I, I've told Ron, you know, I don't even know if, 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 if I have the physical endurance to do a monthly book anymore, because that's a, that's a very physical and mental strain and Ron said, "You're, you know, you're, you're full of it. <laughs> of course, you can do it. You, you're doing a bunch of other things. If you can do all the other junk you're doing. You can do, you, you can do that." I, I, I keep telling Ron, "I think I'm done with comics." And then six months later, I decide I, I discover I've lied again. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the good news is my post Marvel career is is doing well, very well. Um, uh, and every once in a while, I still have a I have a Marvel career, you know, they, they call us to do, you know, they asked us to do a Spider-Man story recently and a Thunderstrike story and, and who knows, you know, any day they may call us to do something else again. Um, what projects are you working on right now? I, I'm, I'm working on a project for uh, Sid Comics. Uh, that's, that's the only comic book thing. Um, and that's a character called Headhunter. That uh, I'm, 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 I'm currently working on, it, and that's that's it for comics. Everything else is outside of comics. And and before we get out of here, I just wanted to ask a question. You've been it. You've been involved in comic books for decades. You you've seen the ups and downs. You've seen so so many so many changes. Right. I was wondering what you think we need to what the industry needs in order to like grow readership and in order to continue to thrive? Well, I think the the industry is going to face a lot of severe challenges right now. Comic book stores, a lot of them were hanging on by a thread before the pandemic. And I can't think that the pandemic did them any good. If I was in charge of a company now, I would be telling my creative people, focus on done in one stories, one issue stories, with hopefully uplifting messages, Um, because I think that's what people need today. Um, I think the the idea of taking stories and scratching them over five or six issues so that you can have a trade paperback, let's not worry about that now. You you can take six issues, six one-issue stories and put them in, in the trade paperback and still have your trade paperback. And you can have you know, bring back subplots, bring back supporting casts, bring back the soap opera elements, which is what really drew most of us to comic books. Because we, you know, every month the story was either good or bad, but we cared about Spider-Man and what was happening in his life because of the soap opera aspects. Mm-hmm. I always look and think the magic of Marvel, the magic of Stanley and Jack Kirby and and Steve Ditko, but mainly the magic of Stan Lee was he brought soap opera to comic books and he and he made us become invested in the characters' lives and the characters' personalities. And, you know, whether or not the villain of the month was a great villain, we didn't ultimately care because we wanted to know what was happening in Spider-Man's life, Thor's life, Captain America's life. That's what, what really drew us into comics. And I think that's sorely lacking now. 
Now comic books are all about the events and the fight and the blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm an old fart and I've just proven it. Because, you know, the people who re- love and read comic books today, they love and read comic books today. So maybe they don't want that soap opera element. But I look at that soap opera element and I think that's what works in television, movies, and in novels. Mm-hmm. You know, most of the time in novels, you know, even if it's, a, you know, as I often tell my wife, it's a love story. And she says, yeah, there, there are vampires walking around. There, there's, a, there's a psycho killer walking around. I said, yeah, but at its heart, it's a love story. Mm-hmm. And she just rolls her eyes and walks away. But anyway, <laughs> that's what we care about. We want to be invested in the characters' lives. And, and I think that yeah. creatively, that's what I would, would tell my people and, and emphasize that a lot. And then I would tell my sales people and, and, and everybody else, let us get new chains of distribution. Comic book stores need help. And, and they always hate when you expand the chain of distribution, but it always benefits them. So don't listen to them. Expand. We have to get into supermarkets again. We have to get into dr- drugstore chains we have to get into the Walmarts and the Targets. And I know DC you know, got into Walmarts, but we, we really have to expand in, into these things. So keep trying to find new ways of expanding. Yeah. Oh, I've, and I've got a bunch of ideas on how to expand into, into these things. I, I just have to convince one of the companies to listen to me. I mean, I, I, I definitely, I agree. I mean, I remember, you know, as a kid, I could find comics everywhere. You know, like the the newsstands, the the markets. I mean, some. I think the first issue of Spider Girl I picked up was at a supermarket. Actually, I think it was the uh, uh, number five, the Venom cover. I think was was which one it was. But yeah, I mean, I think those are all great ideas, and I I, lo- I love getting your you know people's opinions that have have seen the ups and downs. Yeah, well, I've I've you know been with the comic book industry long enough that I've I've seen it about to expire like four or five times already. <laughs> and it always comes back. Once in the 70s, uh, there was a paper shortage. And we were told, the publishers, I was at Archie at the time, we were told we had to cut back our titles by 20% because they needed the pulp for toilet paper. And I thought, wait a minute, we are <laughs> below toilet paper. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, we're not, we're, we're not going to survive this. And yet we did. And we've survived. We keep on surviving. The comic technique, I think, will always be here. It has been here since caveman times. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to continue. What the delivery system is going to be, who knows? Whether or not, you know, what is it, $4 comic book? (laughs) What they call them floppies. I hate that term, but they call it the floppies. Uh, You know, is it going to be that? Is it going to be trade paperbacks? Who knows what the industry is going to be? And the industry changes. There's the superhero industry, and then there's the graphic novel industry. I, I often have women ask me, you know, why aren't there more women in the in the in the uh, comic industry? And I always say it depends on how you define the industry. If you talk about superhero comics, yes, women are at a distinct minority in terms of creative people. They're also a distinct mi- minority in terms of the readership. But if you talk about graphic novels, suddenly men are in, in the distinct minority because most of the graphic novels going out there are done by women, sell to women, uh, women editors. You know, so men, men have the disadvantage there. Yeah. So let's figure out what, what, what you're talking about. Yeah, I think that's a, a great place to end it. And I want to thank you again. It was a. Uh... A privilege and an honor to be able to chat with you this morning. Yeah, thank you so much. I'd love to maybe, you know, maybe do this again sometime. We'll see what the future brings. All right. Uh, at some point, I'm going to be totally kicked out of the industry, and then you won't be able to talk to me anymore. <laughs> well, I, I hope I don't see that day, man. All right, thank you again. Thank you, Ryan. It, it, was, it was a lot of fun.